I am recording this webinar that we're going to be using to cover um, an initial adjustment. And in the top of the chat, you see if you if you haven't opened it before, that's okay because I'm going to share my screen. And when I share my screen, you will see. I hope I've shared the right screen. Yes. So you will see that I've got this. Um, move this out of the way. Let's say I think everybody should be able to see my screen right now. Um, Sam, so, so, somebody's confirm if you guys can see my screen. Okay. Yeah. All good. Okay, all good. And I should be able to transfer from different windows. And you, could you see that screen right now? Can you see me moving to these different windows, Sam? Like, so does it seem yes. Okay, great. So, yes, sweet. Great, great. I'm going to stay on this screen right here, which is the guide that I use to, to work through the webinars. Uh, and, and I, oh no, this is my journal. This is the guide that I use to work through our webinars. I think that every time that I do it, I like to put the links on. They always live on our website. They live on iTunes, these webinars. They, they live on our YouTube channel. Um, and uh, you can get the previous webinars by looking at the email that I sent you yesterday. So today, what I'd like, to, what I'd like us to focus on is the importance of really understanding an initial adjustment. Now. The reason this is so important is because these decisions we make very early um, in the sentence. Let me just see if everybody muted. Um, let's see here if I've got everybody muted here. How do I do this? Um, payments, participants. Yeah. Okay. So welcome, everybody. I, I'm, we're going to get started right now. I'm just muting everybody so that we don't get an echo on the recording. Um, I think everybody's muted now. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to start with this concept of the initial adjustment. And one of the things that I really recommend everybody do, and everybody's from their, a different institution, you know, rarely are, are, are people going to the same institution. The Bureau of Prisons is a huge bureaucracy. As I've shown you where to go and find this information, you can go to the Bureau of Prisons website at BOP.gov and look at your locations and you see all of these institutions. And this isn't really representative of the, of the entire bureau because every one of these institutions has multiple institutions, right? So like in Florence, Colorado, for example, it's, a, it's an FCC, that means a federal correctional complex. And in that complex, you've got the USP, um, one USP, you've got a US uh, a AdMax, you've got the USP High, you've got the FCI, and you also have a minimum security camp. So there are, there are really four different prisons at this complex, and none of the people mix with each other. So all, all of the prisons are um, separate, but they're all on the same complex. So, so what I really recommend you do is look at the handbook for the prison. So like if somebody is going to Jessup FCI, I would really encourage you click on that section there under locations, list of facilities, find the facility if you know where you're going, click it, um, and then when you click it, um, I see that, that we're having one guest that's having a hard time staying in. Sam, if you could reach out to Margaret and just make sure she's okay and she's She's on the, the webinar. But any, any, what we're doing right now is we're looking at where do we find a handbook? All of these handbooks are really important because they'll give a person a sense of what's going on in that specific institution. Now, all of these handbooks are, are specific to the local institution. And although it, they're kind of long, it's 120 pages, this one, it will tell you a lot about what's happening in the, in the prison. And if you understand what's happening in the prison, you can, you can more effectively navigate your, your path. So in this section here where I'm talking about why it's so important to read the handbook, there's a couple of reasons. One of those reasons is that if you understand that environment, you could be more conscious. You can keep your head in the game 
with regard to, okay, what is the staff expecting of me? And what are the opportunities that I can seize while I am in here? It's very important for people in prison to be conscious of not just letting calendar pages turn. Instead, you've got to be anticipating these things called team meetings. And we'll get to that a little bit later in today's webinar. The things that you're doing every day are going to help to influence your, your, your path to try and get out earlier, your path to, to have the easiest experience, your path to having a higher level of liberty when you come home. And a lot of times people that are going into the system, they're so traumatized by the fact that they're just going to prison that they, they go through it in blindly. And if you're blind, you can't see, well, where are the doors that I want to wo walk through that may put me in a position to something better? And because every individual is different, every individual has to have some level of fluency and, and knowledge about what can I do. That's why I recommend you, even though it's eight, it's 120 pages or so for every one of these handbooks, you're going to find that by reading it, you will spot things that can be applicable to you while you're going through the journey. And you can seize opportunities that you otherwise would not know exist. So that's one of the reasons I frequently talk about, hey, get to know the handbook before you surrender. It will really accelerate your pathway to understanding. And it may help to inform questions that you may have for, for our team. You may have questions that we can ask and if you have questions, I want to answer those questions. But if you don't know what's going on in there, you don't even know how to ask the right questions. So that's what I, the first thing I wanted to say about the a &O handbook. And I'm, now I'm going to ask, as I do every time I get to a section, does anybody have any questions about the a &O handbook or anything specific about their particular institution? Um, and if you have them, please click on the chat button or just unmute yourself and ask, and I will respond. But I don't see any questions, and of course you could ask any time, but I'm gonna move on to the next page, the next section, and that's the FRP plan. This is going, the, the, the system is going to describe the FRP plan. Some handbooks give more clarity on what it means. Some of them are kind of vague, but FRP plan is the financial responsibility plan. You can also consider it kind of an extortion plan, how the Bureau of Prisons is going to act as a collector from everybody in prison. So if somebody has a fine, a restitution, or, or a court-imposed cost of incarceration fee, which I have right there, it's all governed by this policy statement here, 5380.008. I think I've got it down here at the bottom as well. Do I have 5380? Um, I didn't, but you could easily find it. I could go to um, Bureau of Prisons, Bureau of Prisons Policy Statement. 50. Michael, you have it. It was at the bottom of, of, of the screen. I have it? Yeah, so it was at the bottom of the screen. Go back okay. to that. Back but, to but at any rate, you could always find them here, right? You could always find them just by using this great tool called Google, and you can find the program statement and read through it. It's long, it's 17 pages, <clears throat> but it's extremely important because it's one of the tools that staff members use to block access to home confinement, block access to other privileges that you can take in prison. So you really want to understand the FRP program. I did have FRP program in there. Oh, final first step back management FRP. Oh yeah, right there. Okay. So it's on the screen itself. Please read that plan because there's a couple of different segments of this that are important. One of those segments is the cost of incarceration fee. Now, typically that's something that the judge would impose. So if your judge didn't impose the cost of incarceration fee, you don't really have to worry about it. But what it on your pre-sentence investigation report, if you've had one already, it will probably say the Bureau of Prisons has calculated it costs 
$3,000 a month or $3,500 a month to incarcerate every person, the judge for some people will, will, will charge them $3,500 a month to be in prison. If it's not part of your sentence and your judgment, then you don't have to worry about that. But you may have restitution. I see that there's a question and I'll turn to that question, Josh, as soon as I just get through these different sections. Um, but restitution is different. If you've got, if your judge has determined that there's been a rest, that there's been a, a loss in your case, a financial loss, um, or if your judge has imposed a fine as part of your sanction, then that's going to show up on your judgment order. And the Bureau of Prisons is going to require you to sign this contract that's called the, the Financial Responsibility Program. And you should understand how it works because if you don't comply with it, it's one of the things that, that the Bureau of Prisons can use to block your access to programs like home confinement or even the CARES Act. You've got to be classified as FRP participates. And you can get that information by reading the policy statement, which is, is down here, FRP plan, right there on 22. Or you can just listen to what I say, and that's make sure that you have enough money in your prison account to cover, the, um, to cover your your, um, your, your, whatever your plan is. The way that they are going to um, assess how much do you have to owe, what is your contract, is they use a formula. And the formula can be somewhat negotiable as long as you do something within reason. What do I mean by that? Well, in the program itself, and I, and I do see the questions from both Chuck and Samantha and, I, and Josh, and I will get to them just as soon as I do my best to explain it. If you have whatever money you have, including the money you earn from working at a job in prison and including the money that comes from your family and friends that send you money, all of that is vulnerable to attack by the Bureau of Prisons everything that comes into your prison account, okay? They're going to allow you $75 a month for your own needs, okay? That's going to be excluded from this plan. So $75 a month, every six months you get evaluated. That's what 75 and 75 is 150, uh, 300. So it's $450 every six months. In a previous webinar, I told you that I used to spend about six or seven hundred dollars a month in prison. <clears throat> so in six months, I would have thousands of dollars coming into my account. If you've got a financial responsibility plan and you have thousands of dollars coming into your account, you should know the Bureau of Prisons is going to use a formula. What's that formula? They're going to say, well, we're going to authorize you four hundred and fifty dollars over six months. Anything more? Anything over that is fair game for them. And that's not, you know, me saying it. That's, you can look at it right here in the, in, the, in the program statement. It says it right here, what, how they are going to look at these restitution orders. So fines and court costs, there's all kinds of stuff in here, but it's going to give you here the payment. There it is on page seven of this document, right? page seven. Um, and, and Gordy, welcome to the program. I'm going to mute you. Um, Thanks, Mike. Yeah. And, and just, just feel free to ask questions. All of this is going to be recorded as well. So don't worry if you've missed a little bit of the earlier. Of course, I'm going to repeat it again tomorrow. And you want to, you're welcome to come tomorrow as well. We're talking about how they calculate this payment. And it's right here on section B where it says the inmate is responsible for making satisfactory progress and meeting his financial plan <clears throat> for providing documentation of these payments to unit staff. That means you are responsible for knowing how much money comes in and whether it's money you earn or money your family sent you. If you work in Unicor, which I'll talk about that a little bit later, it's more set. But here it's, they exclude the first $75. Everything else is vulnerable everything else, okay? But it's the unit manager 
is the determining authority. So my recommendation, if you have a fine or if you have restitution, when you get to your first unit team meeting, which we're going to discuss here, you don't really have a choice, right? It's, it's really, if you don't, if you get classified as FRP refuse, it's going to influence how much you could spend in the commissary. It's going to influence what programs you can participate. It's going to influence your housing assignment. <clears throat> but more importantly, there's going to come a time when you're going to want to get out early. You're going to want to petition for home confinement. You, want to, you don't want this complicating your, your life because it's the first thing they will say. If you're FRP non-compliant, they're going to deny you. So understand this and, and then make amends to deal with it. So if you're bringing in $1,000 a month and six months, you're going to bring in $6,000. They're only allowing you $450, okay? That means there's $5,500 in their view, you're vulnerable. My experience is that if you say, I can willingly pay $100 a month, $150 a month towards my FRP plan, the unit manager will accept that, okay? So try to make, my recommendation is that if you have restitution or a fine, you make a reasonable offer and that will help you later. So now I'm going to turn to the questions that I've received on the FRP plan, but I do want to address the sanctions. Yeah, if you... If you don't do it, the sanctions are going to be, they're going to put you in an undesirable housing environment. They're going to block your access to programs. And it's just not worth a few hundred dollars a month if you've got it. Or don't have money sent to you in prison, which is another option. It's not one I would recommend. But if, if you don't want to pay, that's your option. You can't have money in your account and then choose not to pay towards your financial responsibility plan because they will impose sanctions on you that, that could leave you in prison longer than you want to be. So now I am going to turn to the questions. And I saw the first one was from Josh. Is there a specific spot on our judgments that should show that the fee was imposed? Your, yes, you could just look at your judgment order, Josh, and your judge would have said, I impose a cost of incarceration fee. I can tell you it's relatively rare that they impose that fee. Okay, because it's like three thousand dollars a month. So I think it's very rare. If you have a fine, that's going to be there as well. I hear by the judge is going to say at sentencing, you will have remembered it because when he put down that before he put down that gavel, he would have said, stand up. I hereby sentence you to a term of, you know, 24 months to the custody of the attorney general. And I impose a fine or restitution of $100,000 or something like that. And that would be it. He could say, I char I'm going to put a cost of incarceration fee as well, which would show up. But again, I think that's rare. I still want to address it because if you have it, you've got to position yourself to either pay it or deal with the unit manager and say, I just don't have the money. My wife took it or whatever <clears throat> and show it. But build a record. Don't put yourself in the position of being FRP refused because it could result in you staying longer in prison. And Josh, you can help me. Um, the fine is unfortunately. I clearly remember the fine, unfortunately. Okay, yeah, I got it, Josh, that you remember the fine. That's different. Your fine is probably big, but you can get through this by paying as little as $100 a month and have a pretty good experience in prison. I I'd never paid on my fine more than $200 a month the whole time I was in prison. Now, there's something you should know about expiration as well, because this fine will be with you for 20 years. And, not, and the 20 years doesn't start tolling until you finish with the BOP. And under my sentence, it was a little bit different. I had a $500,000 fine, not a restitution, but because I was sentenced under a different law, it expired 20 years from the day the judge imposed it. So my fine expired after I served 20 years in prison. Mo everybody going in today, the fine doesn't even start until 20 years after you get out. So, but you can deal with it when you get out. My focus today is get you through prison. 
but we're with you all the way through this. So when you get to the other end and you're on supervised release, we'll talk about a financial responsibility plan when you come home and what steps you can take to try and influence that. I think that your behavior in prison should be, you should be thinking about your, the totality of your life because there's going to come a time when we're going to want to try and get that, that financial burden off you. Okay, let me see some other questions that I had. Um, Josh, if you had more, just go ahead and ask below. Um, we had, uh, is there a specific spot? Okay, so that's the, the judge motor. Samantha asks, our order states that restitution does not start until we are on supervised release. That is awesome. <laughs> so thank God for that, Samantha, because that makes things a lot easier. You're going to want to make sure that you show that to your unit team <clears throat> when you're in prison. If, if, somebody, if somebody was not in this program, but was part of our community, because we have, this is our post-sentencing, we have a pre-sentencing, that would have been one of the pieces of guidance or advice that I would have suggested for people is to ask your judge to postpone the FRP, the financial plan, until after you're out of prison. Because as you can see, it makes it very difficult to plan your journey through prison if you're vulnerable to you know, a, a staff member wanting you to take everything you have come in, because then you're limited to only $75 a month, and it's very hard to live in there for $75 a month. So Samantha, that's a real coup, and you're fortunate to have that. Um, Chuck. If I pay full restitution, does that shorten your sentence? Are there any benefits to paying full restitution? Well, I would say it depends on the journey here, where you are. It would have been very helpful had you done that before sentencing, I think. If you've already been sentenced and you've got a restitution order, I, I personally would not wanna pay it all right now because it's not going to get you out of prison earlier I would just want to be compliant with the FRP plan. So let's say that you've got a $100,000 financial uh, uh, sanction as part of your sanction, whether it's a fine or a restitution order, it's not really relevant. It's just a sanction. And you can afford to pay $500 a month and it's not going to cripple you, then offer to pay $500 a month and that's going to stand you out, right? You always have to think about the environment. In prison, if you can pay five, you know, most of the people are poor in prison. They're, they, they don't have $200 a month to spend on commissary. So staff members always think about the adversary, right? Staff members differentiate themselves by collecting money for the system. So that's one of the categories that they're going to check off as far as doing their job. So if you're somebody who makes it easier for staff members to do their job, I think what you're also doing is making things easier on you in kind of a subtle, subtle way. So I want to pay $500 a month. I, I, it's going to be a difficult challenge for me, but I think I can do it. Um, you know, fine. Go to prison with some money and, and say, I, I'm, I'm prepared to pay $500 a month. Um, and that would help. Uh, a lot. And, but, you know, everybody who's on this program, I think, has really strong critical thinking skills. And you can kind of assess the environment and you could, you know, get a feel. How was the staff? What do they expect from me? And, you know, deal with it accordingly. So make a decision. But I don't think the difference between paying it off and paying a few hundred dollars a month is going to make a difference in getting you out early. On the flip side, when you do transition to home confinement and you're on supervised or you're on supervised release, I think we would love to work to help you get off of supervised release. And that it would be a great time to pay it off. You know, that if you can pay it off, you want to, you really want to be building this record starting today of all the ways you're demonstrating your good citizenship. And the more you can document that, the better off you're going to be. But the, but the judicial system and the prison system, they like to see incremental progress, right? They like to take credit. Oh, we're coaching him along. We're helping him along. And so I would, I would be strategic if I were you. I would say, yeah, let me pay a few hundred dollars a month or a thousand dollars a month or whatever is not going to kill you. 
because I want to make a really big impact once I get out. You know, if you've got a year supervised release or two year supervised release, I want you to go there strong and, and be able to make an argument, all the things that you have done to stand out and differentiate yourself from everybody else. Okay. Um, so that was then Clayton. Is there any kind of leniency or patience with indigent clients who have a history within their case of having a public defender? Yeah, for sure. If you don't have money, they're not going to penalize you for not having money. The minimum payment on FRP is $25 a quarter. And that you're going to have a job in prison where you're going to earn enough money to pay that $25 a quarter. But, but they exclude the first $75 anyway, a month. So if you're not earning $75 a month, you're going to be exempt from the FRP plan in the federal system. So you don't really have to worry about that. Okay, I don't see any more questions here. So I'm gonna to turn to number three. And that's, well, why do I need money in prison? Okay, well, the reason you need money in prison is because you have to pay for everything like the phone, okay? I think the phone, if you want to max, oh, right now during the CARES Act, they've, they've sunsetted phone calls. So you don't have to pay for phone calls, I guess, until the CARES Act ends. <coughs> Excuse me. But when I was in prison, I think I used to have to spend $300 or $350 a month just to use the phone. And then the emails you do have to pay for, I don't know what the rate is, but it's some per minute fee of five cents a minute or something like that. And you might spend a couple hundred dollars a month to use the email. Um, but there's also things that you could buy in the commissary. And you can see what that is just by going to uh, the BOP website, I think, um, BOP website, BOP.gov. I like to go there a lot and go to a location again and just pick any of these. Oh, that's, that's a private prison. Let me go to a regular one. Just go to one of the prisons, go to the bottom and you can see a commissary list and you can see what they sell, right? So if I sit here and scroll through here, you can see the things that they sell. I can say that without a doubt, everybody's going to want to buy some things that make their life a little bit easier in there, such as tennis shoes, right? Because they don't give you those. They give you boots when you get there. So you might want to buy some sneakers. You might want to buy some more comfortable socks. You might want to buy your own underwear. You might want to buy uh, your own hygiene things, okay? And there's a limit to how much you can spend. So I don't know that limit today because it changes periodically. Maybe it's three or four, 350 or 400 or maybe 450 a month, something like that. Oh, it says right here, the spending limit is $320. But this is a 2012. See, the BOP is not always so current. So it's 10 years old. <laughs> okay. But that's probably still, you know, what they do because they don't change that that much. Maybe it's 375 or 400. But you're only allowed to spend 75 um, unless you have money coming in and, and you're, you're FRP compliant. So if you've got money, look, it's pretty easy to drop six, 700 bucks a month in there just by looking through this commissary list. And you should look at the one where you are at your institution and say, what do you want to buy um, to make your life a little bit easier, right? So check, take a look at your commissary list. Um, it's, it's kind of a different way of budgeting because you've got to not only figure out how much money do you have in your account, but also how much can you spend because you are you are um, you have to wait until this gets validated every month. It, this, this thing validates every month, but it's not validated on the first of the month. It's validated in accordance to some little formula with your last name and your registration number and things like that. So you might validate every on the 15th, you get a new spending limit. So you just have to kind of learn to create your own budget and your, your uh, local handbook, ANO handbook is going to tell you when they validate. So of the $320, there are some things that don't count like stamps and phone credits and email credits that won't count against your limit. Um, but it's just, it's just something you'll get used to. I just want you to be thinking about that before you surrender so you have a financial plan when you get there. <clears throat> okay, I don't see any questions on the commissary. 
So I'm gonna go to the next one, which is staff hierarchy. Now, the Bureau of Prisons is, is it's a paramilitary organization, okay? So it's kind of like the military where there's a chain of command, right? It's government, it's big government. And they expect you to always go through the chain of command. My goal is to help you get through that journey and get out as soon as possible. And as I've mentioned in some of the previous webinars, that means you really want to be invisible. You don't want to be a bright light. You don't want to bring attention to yourself. And that means you really don't have to worry about the executive staff. I think for many high power biz dev type people, you're used to dealing with decision makers and, and the natural inclination is to go right to the warden, right? We're we'll right to the top. That's not going to serve you well in this environment. This environment, the executive staff is going to include, is going to include, who are they? You know, the warden is the CEO of the prison. Then there's going to be a series of aid associate wardens, okay, who oversee, oversee department heads, okay? Then there's department heads. Then there's, then there's um, staff, line st supervisors, okay, and line staff, okay? That's kind of how the chain of command works. You and the main people you have to be concerned with are the custody staff who runs security and program staff. Security is run by who? The captain is the head of security. Then there's lieutenants, L-I-E-U-T-E-N, lieutenants. Then there's correctional officers, right? There's not, there's not a lot of emphasis on corrections, but that's how custody is broken up. Custody-minded people have one goal in mind, that's to enforce rules, to protect security of the institution. I spelled that wrong. Um, to write disciplinary infractions, which we covered in last week's webinar. You want to avoid those people because they can make your time harder, okay? The program staff is a little bit different. It's the unit team. Who's on the unit team? It's going to be a unit manager. Remember under FRP, I told you that the unit manager has discretion to decide how much you're gonna pay in money. That person you can approach, you can talk to. You can talk to your case manager, right? The case manager is involved in, reports to the unit manager and the case manager is going to be the one who's in charge of everything in your life outside of prison, meaning when they recommend you to home confinement, meaning um, getting you ready to deal with your probation officer, things like that, doing these things called team meetings. Then there's a counselor. Don't expect the counselor to do any counseling, okay? Basically, the counselor assigns bunks where you sleep and jobs, and that's about it, and kind of does inspections and other kind of ministerial administrative work, but they don't do any counseling. So, Understand these are the people that you want to work with. You don't want to work with executive staff and you don't want to work even above the warden. You know, there's the regional staff. And then above the regional staff, there's headquarters, right? BOP headquarters, central office, central office, right? These are things that, that, that have some role in administrative remedy. If we ever have to file an administrative remedy, um, you, have, you, you, you have to deal with the warden, regional staff, and BOP to exhaust administrative remedies. But typically, <clears throat> my recommendation is don't let these people even know who you are, okay? Just be a number and get through this journey. Let them do their job and have their fiefdom. <clears throat> That's one of the things you will see. It's kind of, it's kind of um, comical, the way that you see how different it is in there from the real world where you have this real focus on chain of command. I recommend that you respect the chain of command, but focus on these two areas right here. Custody, programs. Avoid problems and interactions with custody. Always be polite. Always be courteous to all staff members. And you will go a long ways toward avoiding problems. And really, that's what success in prison is about is crisis management. 
It's understanding I'm here temporarily. I got to get out of here. And in order for me to get out of here, I've got to recognize this environment is very different from anything I've done as a businessman, as a successful professional or whatever you've done in your world. This is their world. And their world is really about protecting security of the institution. The good news, if you've been following my blog and my, my information is that this past week, the Bureau of Prisons appointed a new director. And I wrote about that and you'll see her on the blog. <clears throat> her name is Colette Peters. And I'm very optimistic about Colette because she didn't come up through custody. She came up through programs. Her background is in psychology and in criminal justice. So she's gonna have a different mindset than a lot of the other staff members. It's going to probably take six months for her to know where the pencils are in that agency, it's so big. But she, she was previously built her career as the director of the Oregon State Prison System. She studied the Scandinavian prison system in Norway, which is very different from ours, which historically has been very punitive. She's about programs, connecting people to society, helping people emerge successfully. So I look to see really positive changes under her leadership, but I wouldn't expect to see those changes for six months to a year. So I'm optimistic because I, somebody who had to train myself to think long-term, but for those of you who have less than six months to serve, you may not notice anything, but you very well may because she start her first day is August the 2nd. And she, for my, my work in the nonprofit space is given me indications that she's going to be very, uh, um, she's going to accelerate this transformation. There's a lot of problems in prisons, right? I mean, the Bureau of Prisons has been really tarnished its reputation with corruption and, and, and problems in different institutions. So she's going to want to fix that. And that may be directives that, that cause staff members to have to change the way they manage the institutions. And I think that is a positive sign. You frequently heard me say that if somebody has to go to prison, there's never been a better time than right now. But that doesn't mean you want to take your eye off of the best practice way of getting through it. And that's the focus. If I'm going to interact with staff, it's going to be with program staff, not with um, custody staff and not with the executive staff. Um, executive staff deals with problems, right? I was a problem in prison because I was always focused on doing more. But I don't think anybody in our group is serving a really long sentence, like in excess of 10 years. So your objective is going to be, I want to get out of here as soon as I possibly can. And so I want to learn how to do that. That's what I, this is what my recommendation would be, is to be invisible. So understand the, the different staff members and teams, um, and then understand education, psychology, and the chapel. These are typically people that work in those departments will be better, more receptive to listening. But prison's really about being self-directed, just like success in life is about being self-directed. Understand what you want and craft a plan that's gonna, going to help you get there. That's what I learned going through my journey. And that concludes my little presentation on staff hierarchy. I, do I see any questions? Um, Chuck, what type of job should one seek and how does one obtain a desirable job? That's a great question. The answer to that question, however, really predicates understanding who you are, right? I can tell you for me, well, I can tell you what I typically saw in prison. Typically, people with really short sentences, keeping busy is hard, and they, they want to be active. It helps them pass the time better. So they like a structured day. They want to work in a job that requires them to be there at 7.30, and they're there until 3, and they, it just helps them get through the day because they know they've got to go to work, then they get lunch, then they finish work, and then they do their recreational things in the evening, okay? And there's a lot of jobs like that. There are clerical jobs. There's food service jobs. There's some prisons have factory jobs. There's landscaping jobs. There's all kinds of jobs. And, I, and, and, and 
a lot of white collar, short term people really didn't mind that. For me, it was all about, I wanted to control my own schedule. I wanted to have freedom of time and autonomy. And so what kind of job is that? That's typically an orderly job, okay? Where, or work in education, or the difference if you go to work in education, you've got, you've got structure, you've got to be there. So I got to report there, I got to hang out there all day. I don't have really liberty of movement. I've got to be where I'm supposed to be. If you're an orderly, meaning you're like cleaning an area, after you clean the area, your supervisor is probably going to say, go do what you want. Just make sure that you've cleaned your area. That's a pretty simple job that may take uh, all of five or 10 minutes a day. How do you get that job? It's really quite simple. Once you get to the prison, you're going to find who the kind of people of influence are. They're going to welcome you. Okay. I guarantee you. What's going to happen, we, last week or in the previous week, we talked about a and and, and and you go get processed and then you get to the camp. And we should talk about that today, what happens once you surrender and present yourself into the environment. There's going to be somebody who's going to come up, shake your hand, welcome you. How are you doing? Let me show you where you are. They're going to show you to your bunk. They're going to talk with you. They're going to say, is there anything I can do to make it easier? Um, here's some toothbrush, toothpaste and a toothbrush and some slippers and things like that. Just to try and get easier. If you want to take a walk around the track, I'm here to help you. I, I, I mean, there's definitely going to be somebody that helps you that way. Cause that's how prison is, right? Everybody's going to be, have, remember when they first surrendered. And it's one of the ways that people feel great about their life is helping others. And you're going to ask them, what's the best job here for me? Well, the first thing I would be asking myself, do I want to be completely independent and control my own schedule or do I want some structure? If you know that you want to have freedom of time on your own, say, ask that guy who comes and helps you, what's the best job here for me to have freedom of time? And he's going to tell you some places it might be food service. Well, yeah, get a job just wiping down the tables. You only have to go there. Um, after the morning meal and you clean the tables and it takes you 20 minutes and then you're free the rest of the day. That's possible in some prisons. Some people might be an orderly. Some people may may work on the recreation yard. It depends on the institution. And the only one who can answer that question is somebody who's living in the institution. So you will find that information when you get there. Um, But, uh, and there, you, you should also ask the other members of our team who do a lot of the one-on-one work. I don't do that, so I'm not as in touch with what's going on in different prisons. But if you're going to a prison um, like Maxwell or Pensacola or something like that, I I have no doubt that we know people who are there. And just ask our team member, ask Sam to connect you to somebody. And then, you know, we could kind of launch a chain of events or write a letter to somebody who's there and say, hey, our friend's coming here would you look out for him? And then you've got somebody waiting for you when you get there. So please check with Sam or check with Justin and we'll do our best if we've got somebody there to connect you. So there's somebody there to welcome you when you get there. And that person would be the one to help you not only tell you what's the best job for you, given what you want to do, and, um, and then uh, answer your questions on, on, say, if that's what you want to do, this is the best job for you. If this is what you want to do, this is the best job for, for you. Now, if you want to eat really well, well, you might want to work in the kitchen. If you want to have time to work out all the time, you might want to work at the gym. Okay. If you want to teach other people, you might want to work in education. There's a lot of jobs in prison and you're going to figure that out once you get there. My, my, hopefully my job is to help you understand this is something you're going to handle. Not a big deal. Um, are there other questions? No. But if I didn't answer that question, stick with me through the end of the webinar and we can get back into more detail on the jobs, the different jobs in the prison. Now I'm going to turn to number five and that's the dress code. So in prison, you are supposed to be in uniform Mondays through Fridays, unless it's a federal holiday, between 7.30 and 4 p.m. So anytime you go to the chow hall, you've got to be in their uniform. And I was, you know, in all kinds of security levels, but in minimum security camps, typically 
that means you're wearing green khaki pants and a matching green olive drab khaki shirt. Um, you can wear, um, you have to wear institution shoes. Typically, you may be able to get a soft shoe permit and be able to wear tennis shoes. But if you don't have it, you, you typically have to wear their boots, which are, I hate it. But every prison's a little different. There were prisons I, I was in that would allow, that would not punish you for wearing tennis shoes to the chow hall or something like that. But if you're going to go approach staff members, you have to remember to be in uniform because they will give you a disciplinary infraction if you're not. You also have to have your ID with you at all times. That's your responsibility. So it's just like your driver's license or more importantly, like your cell phone out here, right? You never leave without your cell phone. Um, but in prison, um, shoot, I wish I had one. I, I, have a, I have my ID card from prison somewhere around here. I'd love to show it to you, <laughs> but I will in the next webinar. It's just like a little driver's license. It has your picture and your registration number, and you always got to keep it in your pocket. So uh, after hours or on weekends, you're, you, it's more relaxed. You can wear your sweatpants that you buy in the commissary. You can wear a t-shirt. You can wear shorts. You can wear tennis shoes. Um, but while you're, unless you're in recreation, you've got to be in your uniform. So remember that. And um, <clears throat> Most, of, most people on this program are going to minimum security camps, so they don't have movements. I should put that on here as well, movements. Remember what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. Um, in minimum security camps, it's known as open movement, meaning you can be in the housing unit and walk wherever you want to go at any given time, except during census counts. But on um, uh, in in other types of institutions, whether it's a medical center or a low security prison or a detention center, um, you're only allowed to go from one area of the prison to another area of the prison during movement time. So they might say from five minutes to the hour until five minutes after the hour, that's when it's open movement and you're allowed to leave your housing unit and walk to the rec yard. If you're going to the camp, that's not really relevant, but in other institutions it is. When you're the only time you're allowed to be out of uniform during those weekday hours is if you're walking to the rec yard, then you can just, you know, go in your recreation clothes, but you better be going to the, to the, to the gym or to the yard and not to education because it, they'll, they'll cite you with disciplinary infractions. So understand all of these rules. They're all going to be spelled out in the handbook, but if you have questions on, dress codes, because it's kind of weird in society, you don't have that. I mean, I work from home, so I'm always dressed kind of casually. Um, but in prison, that's not the way it is, right? It's, 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 it's like a military type of environment. So just prepare yourself for it and you're cool. Um, I see a question from Chad, strange question, but what are guys wearing to sleep in dorms and in cells? Not a strange question at all. And there are no strange questions because Prison is a strange environment to anybody who's never been there. <laughs> I can tell you when I was in prison, because I understood the rules, you have to make your bed every day. I always found it easier to leave my bed made and I would sleep in uh, sweatpants and a sweatshirt and I, I'd have my bed made and I'd lie on the top of my made bed and just put a blanket over me and sleep like that. And then I'd hop off and I'd, and I'd still be in my sweat clothes. I did that because I would, I used to, if you read my books, you'd say I used to wake up at like one or two o'clock in the morning and, and go start working on my projects. Um, but most people sleep under the covers and they would just sleep in their underwear or if they want to sleep in their sweat clothes, they can. Um, you'd have to buy those in the commissary. But most people in prison sleep in their, in their I would say, in their underwear or in their and sweat clothes, you know, but most people sleep in the, in under the covers and you know, they're not institutionalized like I was. Um, so yeah, no, not a strange question at all. There are no strange questions. Prison is a strange environment, but I don't have any questions here on dress code. I will say that um, speaking of this though, you should be conscious of going to the shower and the bathroom because prisons have community bathrooms, right? So you leave your cell and you walk to a big, bathroom area where they have toilets frequently installs 
I would say all now when I started in prison, they were just an empty toilet there. And, you know, you just do your business in front of everybody. But now they're kind of a stall. What do I mean by a stall? Like if you go to a restaurant, you know, that stall, they, they typically have something like that. Then they have showers. Some prisons still have a shower with a central pole and spouts coming off and you shower there. Um, most of them, the showers are also in stalls. So you would shower by yourself with some semblance of privacy. But I would recommend that you just be conscious of the institution, right? Seek first to understand before you seek to un be understood. Look around, see the behavior of what's going on in the prison. How do people use the bathrooms? I would recommend that regardless of what other people are doing, be very conscious of cleanliness, wash your hands, clean the area that you've left behind. When you go to the bathroom, bring with you your like hygiene kit, which you can have there. So like it might be a bag filled with your toothpaste, your toothbrush, your wash rag, if you have it, toilet paper, um, you know, whatever else you need. Um, and then, you know, try to leave the place clean. And that's going to put you in good stead with the other people with whom you're serving time. In this era of, um, you know, reform, I think prisons are not as crowded as they were when I served my sentence. A lot of people have gotten out, but still people are going to be very conscious about the bathroom because that's where germs get spread. And living in prison is definitely living in a fishbowl. So you want to understand how people live and you want to be respectful of that. It, it's, uh, there are some people in prison who have very poor hygiene habits. You know, that's just life. Um, just like there are people out here that have poor hygiene habits. But out here, you can get away with them and you can separate. In prison, you can't. In prison, you know, it, you, you've got to adjust with the other people. So my recommendation is you really live with your eyes wide open and you're respectful of it. And you remember this even as the weeks turn into months because people can have a tendency to get used to prison. And if you're used to prison, that can lead to potential problems with other staff or other people in prison. And any kind of problem can complicate the efforts that we want you to make to get out early. And that's as much important on your behavior going forward as it is on what's going on with the administrative staff, both in Washington, D.C. and at the local institutional level. So you can't control what other people are doing. You can control what you're doing. Understand the rules, understand how you can live within those rules and still achieve your goals. And you'll make it easier when we're going to start advocating to get you out earlier. Um, next, I don't see any other questions there. I mean, again, there's nothing you can't ask me, but let's go to now community contact, okay? There's only a few ways that you stay connected to the world in prison. That's telephone, that's email, that's US Postal Service, and that's visiting. That's it, okay? Be aware of, of these four things and how to use them. I gave you information in the first webinar that I would recommend you have your list of contacts typed out and you get them to yourself in three different ways. One of them I recommended you mail it to yourself a couple of days before you surrender. One I recommended you carry it in an envelope that says legal mail and you keep that in there. I don't know if the guard will let you keep it or not, but if it says legal mail, there's a chance of it. And the third I recommended is you just bring it with you on a page, single page, you know, like this, like this, right? I've got, I don't know if you can see this, but you know, I've got the members of my team here with their email and their phone number so I can reach them right away. Just bring something like that with the person's name, email, phone number, because you're gonna have to enter that into a computer data system as soon as you uh, get on the compound. And that's going to be your approved phone list. You're gonna use it for your email list. You're gonna use it to send letters to other people. It's just very helpful. Um, for visiting, it's a little bit different. You've gotta to get to the prison 
ask for a visiting form, right? I should put this on here. I'll see if I could put an, in the show visiting form. You've got to get the form from the local institution, send it to the people you want to visit. They've got to fill it out and send it back. So I'll make sure I put a sample sample in, in on a website. I plug that there. So I'll remind myself when I create the page for this, it'll have a PDF sample of, the, of what a visiting form looks like. And I want you to send that to the people you want to connect with while you're in prison. In this era of you know, COVID, visiting is way more restricted than when I was in prison, but they're still going to have protocols on who can visit. And so you want to know what those are. And I will put the policy statement for visiting forms and sample visiting forms on the web page that I create that goes along with this. So you want to send that to your family members or others and have them fill it out and send it in. Now, theoretically, if the people show up on your pre-sentence investigation report, they don't need a visiting form. That's theoretical though, right? In prison, sometimes staff members want that form and you're just better off giving them the form than arguing with them, in my view. You got to pick which battles you want to fight. And it's always best to just comply and move forward. I see a question from Samantha. Do you anticipate a lot of resentment from the staff if the higher ups begin to implement changes? I think there's going to go through a process in there that there will definitely be resentment um, from staff uh, because of a lot of reasons. Prison is, it's like a throwback. It's not part of America in some ways where there's some misogyny, there's racism, there's, um, you know, problems. I mean, there was a big article in the paper the other day that my partner sent me about what's going on in a federal prison. I think it was in Texas where a lot of corruption and, you know, staff members cover staff members' backs. And, you know, there's a lot of problems around that. And there's a good old boys network in there. And this new administrator, by all measures, is a real leader and believes in people. And I think one of her first priorities is going to be to unite the staff because there's 36,000 staff members. So she's going to put a lot of emphasis on that. She recognizes, I've read things that she recognizes the relationship between, you know, unhappy staff members and high suicide rates and unsafe prisons and, you know, mental health challenges. And she's going to want to change that. Will there be resentment? Probably from people who are of the old guard, yes. But I don't think it's going to influence people that are serving sentences. I think it's, there's only upside for people serving sentences because you're going to see that there's more responsive, re responsiveness, more responsiveness to administrative remedies and, you know, assessing things. Do I think you're going to see it in six months? No. Do I think you'll see it in a year? Yes. So um, I'm very optimistic about the new director. Um, I don't see any other questions here about six and community contact. So I am going to move forward. Um, I also remember that I told you in the, um, when you look at your institutions, you can see whether it's a care level one, two, or three, which is going to influence how much access people have to visiting. Some of them have none right now because of their, their anticipating higher COVID cases in that region or in that area. So this is a very important one, programs, okay? It's not something we think about in the real world, okay? What's a program? You know, if you're gonna go to college, you go to college. But in prison, everything's called a program. And the programs have more relevance and more, um, it's just more relevance to every person in prison than ever before. If, you're, if you anticipate trying to get out of prison on a compassionate release motion, then you want to have a really solid record of programs. And some of the, the most popular one that people want to get involved with is RDAP because it's the only program that results in an, in an administrative time cut where you can get out of prison a full up to a year early or have a year cut off your release date. 
Um, that's the only program that allows that other than these other programs that are called uh, related to the First Step Act, which I'll talk about a little bit here. But RDAP is more established. It's been around since 1995, I think. So it's established. First Step Act is brand new. I mean, it was signed into law in 2018, but it's still very new. They're just implementing it now. It might not be fully implemented probably till 2024. <clears throat> but RDAP is a program. What is that program? It's a drug program. There's educational programs. You've got to have show that you have an education or participate in educational programs. Unicor is a factory that exists not in all federal prisons, but in most federal prisons. And um, if you have a short sentence, you probably won't apply to you because there's always a waiting list to get into Unicor. But it's the factory, um, a place where people go to work to sew mail bags or to build cabinets or to um, deal with electronics or to sew battle dress uniforms for military. So Unicor is a wholly owned government business called Federal Prison Industries. And that's a program. What's, what, why are these relevant? Because some of them can result in getting earned time credits under the First Step Act. This is such a complicated law that President Trump signed. It'd take me, you know, a 10 hour webinar to get into it. But I did create some resources for you that you can find um, with hopes of helping you understand it. So if I scroll down here, I can look at this one here. Okay, I'm gonna click that. I'm gonna open it up here in a new window. And you can see this kind of primer on what is the First Step Act and how does it affect you? How does it influence you? The big thing about it is that it can allow you to go to home confinement earlier. It can allow you to get these earned time credits that will allow you to um, spend more of your time on home confinement than, than existed before. This, this document right here I published um, this morning just with the idea of helping you kind of understand it. If you have questions after you read it, you can ask me. And I'll, and I'll do my best answer. Next week, I'm going to interview a former director uh, that, that presided over this program that will be helpful. But you'll notice I said that there are approved programs that qualify for these credits. Now, earned time credits are different from good time credits. Good time credits are what, what you get for not getting in trouble. That's basically it. If you don't get a disciplinary infraction after you serve time, assuming your sentence is longer than one year, like 12 months in a day, you earn up to, well, not up to, you'll earn 54 days a year or 54 days will be credited to your sentence at the conclusion of the year. So as long as you get to that point, like, on a year and a day, you take out 54 months. After 10 months, basically, you finish the year. And then you start the next year. And then when you get to the 10 months, 54 days comes off and that's credited. And it's part of your time now. It's vested. It can't ever be taken away from you. And earned time credit is different. That you do have to earn by participating in programs. What programs? Well, they've published a document here. These are the approved programs. And again, that shows up down here under approved programs. So you can look at them yourself. But you can scroll through this document that was published July 22. And this is continuing to evolve. In fact, I, before you get out, you may see the prison professors program on there. I'm really working to make that happen right now. But these are the courses that are available. They're not all available in all prisons. But if you scroll through this document, you will see, well, what's available in the prison where I am? And you just scroll through there and it'll, it'll show you this one's available in all prisons. This one's available only in these prisons. Okay. This is how many hours you get in, in your nine credits. So these are all the approved programs. There's a lot of them. There's way too many for me to cover on here. 
But a program is really just a way for you to go spend your time. Okay. And it's, it should help you build your release plan. If you're participating in these programs, please document it. Okay. Because if you document it, it's going to help you later when we get to this section of trying to qualify you for home confinement. Okay. When you're going to try and qualify for transition to serve the latter part of your sentence at home. Okay. There are, there, I, you should have in here the, the First Step Act. Okay. FSA, First Step Act. That's, that's what I'm talking about right now. But there's also the Second Chance Act, okay? The Second Chance Act, which was passed in 2008, so it's kind of weird. The First Step Act was passed in 2018, okay? Second Chance Act was passed in 2008. The Second Chance Act, it authorizes the Bureau of Prisons to send people to the community for their last year of imprisonment. Under the First Step Act, you can go much beyond that. Under the CARES Act, there are guidelines that says you only have to serve 25% of your sentence. So there's a lot, of, a lot of nuances to all this stuff that you should be at least somewhat fluid with or literate with. But at the end of the day, if you, if you need personal guidance on that, I would ask you to reach out to Sam because it's really more applicable to people that are serving longer than a year in prison and that want to get out earlier or longer than two years in prison, because there are steps that you can take to advance or accelerate your, your, your candidacy for early release, right? Everything after sentencing is about self-advocacy. The lawyer can't do it for you. You've got to do it for yourself and you've got to know that the prison system isn't always helpful to you, right? And, and, I, and, I, and I just plug this up here. This is the final rule. Um, it's how the Bureau of Prisons kind of does things. It, it makes things happen. There's actually this, this is really interesting the way that it happens, but, but I just wanted to show it right here of what happens. Congress passes a law, the president signs or passes legislation, the president signs the legislation into law, and then the BOP is supposed to carry it out. But the BOP sometimes takes a lot of nudging and pushing to get them to do it, as is evidenced by this comment right here. The Bureau's definition of a day as one eight-hour period of a successfully completed program is incorrect, unworkable, and contrary to congressional intent. That opens up a dialogue. And you'll see even here, Congress, a congressman's writing and saying, hey, BOP, you're really not doing what I did. And you're not even doing it in a good faith effort, right? Defining a day as eight hours of participation does not appear to be a good faith attempt to honor congressional attempt, right? That's something that happens all over the Bureau of Prisons. I've mentioned it in all the webinars. I was in prison during every big major piece of reform legislation. And although Congress says one thing, the BOP will try and do its own thing. So we need to be able to help you advocate for yourself and push and push and push. That doesn't always mean fighting. It means building a good record before so that when you make the request, you're in the best possible situation. And that's why I put these resources here for you to kind of understand a &O, understand the a &O handbook. What do they expect you to do? Figure it out and be the best person in the camp. OK, that's going to qualify you to get out earlier or to have a less the, the least amount of disruption to your life as possible. And success here is not being the superstar of the camp. It's to get out. Never lose sight of what success is. It's to get out. There's going to be a lot of people in prison who are manipulative. There's going to be a lot of people in prison who have been incarcerated for a long time and they view this as their domain and they kind of get their mental health a little bit messed up, you've got to keep your mental health intact and say, okay, I know where I am and I know I'm going to use all of my critical thinking skills to get through to this in the best way possible. What's the best solution? Always be courteous 
and non-confrontational with staff members, understanding who they are, what their role is, how they define success, and figure out, oh, I got to avoid people and I've got to be courteous when I have to interact with them, right? That's why I had that little section earlier on, on understanding staff. In each of the previous lessons, I spoke about a journal. And our friend Chuck, I think it was, asked me about that. And I promised him that by next week, I would build one. So you can see I lived up to that. And there it is on Amazon right there. It's a daily journal. What does it look like? Well, it's just a, pay, a document that has a lesson on one page and, 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 and information and then something you could use to write. Why do I recommend getting this? Because you can't get a day timer in prison. They won't allow them. They won't allow you to get a book like this that has all blank pages in it. So I told Chuck that this week I would spend some time working through it and creating and put it on Amazon. It's going to support any resources are going to go to support the nonprofit. But my recommendation are, is that you do keep a journal, whether you do it on a document like that or just on a blank piece of paper, write what you're doing every day out. I, I do that today, right? If I share my screen with you, you can see I, keep, I still keep journals. I've been doing this since I got out of prison. Every month I'm writing, what am I doing? How am I working to build my business or train our team or create new opportunities or record, right? Why do I do that? It's just good business practice when you've gone through the criminal justice system, okay? People are always looking at us and you always have to be able to say, what have I done? What am I doing? That's gonna happen when you try to argue to get out of prison. And it's gonna happen when you try and uh, argue to have a higher level of liberty when you come home. When I came home, <laughs> I came home and I, and I stacked all these books that I wrote, like this one and these books. I mean, I, I did, wrote like 20 books in prison and I put them on the desk. And what did it do? It allowed me to advocate for myself more effectively. My case manager in the halfway house gave me tremendous liberty. My uh, probation officer, when I transitioned to supervised release, allowed me to travel domestically without permission, asking permission. And they allowed me to be an entrepreneur, even though I just got out of prison after 25 years, 26 years. So it can work wonders for you. And it's why I still do it today. So I would encourage you, write your stuff on a blank piece of paper. If you want to find a journal that you can get in there, then find it. If you like this one, buy it. If you've got 10 months to serve, get 10 of them. And then when you come home, you're going to be able to put these 10 stacks on your probation officer's desk and say, this is how hard I work. And then when we come and try and help you get off supervised release early, we want to present it to a judge, right? Always be thinking about the challenges you're going to have in the future. And I think you'll do way better. That's, I never asked anybody to do anything I didn't do. That's what I did. Some people might get scared. Oh, I don't want to write a manuscript while I'm in prison. Well, I want you to look at this program statement here, and you can see it's a Bureau of Prison Program Statement on inmate manuscripts, right? I hate that word inmate, but that's what they call us. Um, it says in here, an inmate may prepare a manuscript for private use or for publication while in custody without staff approval, okay? You don't need staff to approve you or to authorize you to write your own manuscript. And if you're going to be sitting in there, there's, this is a great time to write your life story. It's a great time to start redefining the next chapter of your life. And I would highly encourage you to do that because it's an effective way to avoid the noise of prison, to focus on your mind, to develop. And I, and I, and I would just really highly encourage people to use their time to write. It really worked for me. And I, I think it can work for anybody else. I, I have a question. I may have missed them. Let me look at them again. Do you anticipate a lot of No, Clayton Bowers. Perhaps a question different than my state experiences with halfway houses after release, but what are the quality of these BOP federal halfway houses? I have seen many unhealthy halfway houses that I felt were counterproductive. Do we have a role at all in where someone might be placed? 
Okay, that's a great question. It's a little bit outside of the scope of this webinar, but I will say our job is going to be to get anybody going to a half house, get them to home confinement. And, and there are pathways to do that, but every individual has to help us build that record. The more somebody works in avoiding disciplinary problems in prison and works toward building a record of pro adjustment and building a record that shows you've got a great release plan, the easier it's going to be to get you to home confinement. And in an interview I did a couple of weeks ago with a former head of home confinement in halfway houses, he also stated the importance of having a good release plan because halfway houses are very few and far between. They're a limited resource and they, they, they really need to reserve them for people who don't have a home. You know, there's a lot of people that come out of prison and they're homeless. That's who they want to give priority to at the halfway house. Our job is to get you home as soon as possible. Um, I see another one. What programs are available to reduce one sentence if the sentence is less than one year? Well, the Second Chance Act really applies to you on that. You qualify for that the day you get there. Are they going to allow you to go home the day you get there or go to a half house the day you get there? Probably not. But if you've got a sentence of less than a year, you could be in a position to be getting out at 25%. So if you've got 10 months, you know, you're going to qualify to be out in two and a half. And how are you going to be the best candidate for that person at two and a half? Get there, be a submarine, be under the radar, participate in programs, work. And remember, you're going to get not the video webinars, but I keep sending information into the prison um, twice a month that's telling you what's happening. Next week, I'm going to interview the former director of the Correctional Program Division for the Bureau of Prisons. And I'm going to get a little more insight on how they're applying CARES Act right now. How, how do you advance your possibility? Um, but if you've got certain underlying medical conditions um, and you, you may be vulnerable to COVID, you can build a case for that. But I think the best way is to be invisible and go through this process. You can't push the process along because the BOP has a, a, a guideline. That guideline for people that have less than 18 months is at 25%, you qualify for this process to get to home confinement. If you want to read about it, where would you go? I'll show you. Go to prison professors. Go to, I think it is going to be advocacy news, but if not, it could be under after sentencing. Let me look, scroll down. Understand the mitigation art, CARES Act reentry. Um, it might be right here. Oh, here they are, right here, right here. If you look at these memorandums right here, they're going to tell you, right? There's three memorandums. I will put this in the show note. So I, in order for me to put it in the show note, I got to open it in an incognito window and I'll drop it in the show note. So look at this program statement right here. I'm going to put it here in show notes. Um, and what it will show is that there's the guidelines right here. This is from the director. I interviewed him. You can see my interview with him. These are the things that they're going to consider, okay? If this person has a sentence of 18 months or less remaining on their sentence and have served 25% or more of that sentence, that's who they're looking to put on home confinement, okay? So we want to build a record for you that shows this kind of information. Um, and, but you don't want to do it too soon. And you don't want to be the guy that's tooting your horn. I'm entitled to it. Let's get through the two months. And then, and then we can't, you can't really do too much of it before because you have not, um, you haven't done any programs yet. I want you to do some programs, but Chuck, you were asking me that question. I don't know if you could stay on the, the, the webinar after I finish it, because I, I don't know if you've spoken with our teammate, Larry,
but I would recommend you connect with Larry directly because he may be able to do some preliminary work with you before you go. Um, let's see. Okay, Chuck. So, so Chuck, if you can stay on, stay after I finish it. Are you allowed to bring the journal with you when you surrender? No, you will not be able to bring the journal with you when you surrender. So you want to have it like before you surrender, you might go to Amazon and order it. Um, could you tell me, Chuck, when are you surrendering? Uh, type, if you type it in there, I'll know. But you want it, I'd, I'd order the journal like a week before you surrender so it gets there in the mail because you can't bring stuff with you when you surrender. Josh asked, we mentioned, you mentioned folks with 18 months are required to try to say, what about folks with exactly 18 months? That's good. That fits within there, right? 18 months or less. Isn't that what it says? Or of 18 months or, or less, right? So you qualify, Josh, um, if you've got 18 months. But please connect with my partner, Lawrence Hartman. Lawrence, um, he, he can give you some guidance on that and kind of tee you up. You should definitely, if you haven't spoken with Larry before, you should talk with him before you surrender. And, and if you need to know how to do that, whoever is your contact within our group, if it's Sam, Sam will connect you. If it's Justin, Justin will connect you. Um, but you want to connect with Larry. Um, Samantha. Um, oh, there's that. Say that. Is that 20% after deducting the good time? Yeah, it's going to be after you do the good time. I will stay on after the webinar to stay with Larry. Just talk with Larry. Great. Okay, so those are that. Those are um, areas that I think that you need to be aware of. You need to anticipate problems with the Bureau of Prisons. And then you say, okay, I'm going to do everything within my power to overcome them because there's problems in prison, right? That's why you've got to be your best self-advocate. And, and these are the tools that I used to get through my journey. So I, number nine, I wrote about beware, right? Beware of everybody in prison. Be cynical, be kind, be protective of yourself. There's a lot of people in prison that try to help themselves by bringing other people down. And what do I mean by that? They'll, they'll, they'll set people up and be very protective of yourself and be cynical, okay? You're in a group of people that many of them are, are con men. Many of them are just different. And you've got to use all of your critical thinking skills when you're in that environment. I was always kind and, and, and friendly to everybody, but I never forgot where I am, right? I'm in prison. And that, that applies if you're in a high security penitentiary or in your minimum security camp. Remember, the minimum security camp doesn't mean that everybody in there is a business person, well-educated. There are going to be people in there that had 20 years and they just work their way down and they're in that camp, but they still have kind of a mental health challenge. There are also going to be people in there that got caught for something like um, filing a false tax return, but that doesn't mean they're not a predatory criminal. They just didn't get caught for it. Okay. So, always be aware of the people and really be aware of contraband because there's a lot of contraband in prisons. Make sure you don't have anything to do with it because it doesn't, it's a very short term gain and a very high risk. It keeps you in prison longer. It can send you to higher security and you'll see it a lot around you, but be the, you know, be the person that's kind of the submarine, just try to get through and not noticed and not do anything wrong and don't give off the vibe that you want to do anything wrong because there's there's there if you want trouble it's all around you in prison but if you want to avoid it i got through 26 years without a single altercation with other people and the only disciplinary infraction i ever got was for giving money to somebody um and that was a strategic flaw on on my end but just be cautious that's all i want you to be cautious and now we're going to go to structure. So the structure of the day, <clears throat> there's a lot of these things called census counts in prison. And those census counts start, it depends on the local institution. But when I was in prison, there's a census count at midnight, census count at 3 a.m., census count at 5 a.m., census count at 10.30 a.m., 4 p.m., 7 p.m., 10 p.m., Seven counts, okay? 
And in those seven counts, that means all movement stops and the, the officers just go around and do a census count. How many people are here? Two of those counts are what's called stand-up counts, meaning, you know, at three in the morning, they allow you to be lying in bed asleep, but at seven o'clock or four o'clock in the afternoon, everybody has to stand up and be by their bunk or wherever they're supposed to be. And so just understand that there's a lot of these disruptions. It's part of living in prison. If you understand it, I can deal with it. Call outs. This is something that's a little bit more difficult for people to understand, but it's very important. Every single weekday, there's going to be at the start of the housing unit, a clipboard. And that clipboard is going to have all of the callouts. The callouts are the appointments that staff members have scheduled with people in prison. And so the person's name and registration will be on that call out if a staff member has scheduled an appointment with them. Your responsibility is to look at that call out sheet every single day that it's, and it's always posted before four o'clock in the afternoon. Look for your name in alphabetical order. Probably eight out of 10 times your name won't appear there, except for during the first month. During the first month, it'll be there a lot. After that, eight out of 10 times your name won't be on it, but you've got to look because if your name is on it and you miss it, you're going to get a disciplinary infraction and that's going to mess up everything. So please remember this is important. It's very hard for people to get used to when they're brand new, but a, you know, um, a rule oriented officer will give you a disciplinary infraction for, for, for missing a call out. So make sure that you're aware of it. Urine tests. They happen a lot in prison, they're random, but when they call you for a urine test, you have to perform within two hours. <laughs> so if you can't, right, you can't perform in two hours, then you, you'd better be courteous to the officer and say, I just went pee, please, I, I wanna comply, <laughs> let me drink water or whatever. And most of them will, will allow you, some people, you know, can get a little bit um, cantankerous with staff. It only makes things worse. Always, you know, be courteous to staff. And that kind of throws them off because they don't expect that from a lot of people in prison. Medical process, if you get sick, there's a process. It's not like you might do out here. Just call the doctor and go in or go to urgent care. There, if you're feeling sick on Monday, you're going to be able to make an appointment by Thursday. Okay. You've got to go out to sick call, not to see a doctor, but to make an appointment, which is kind of weird, but it's just the way the system works. It's why I say prison is really about self-service, being self-directed. If you have a chronic health problem, then you're going to want to address that the first day you surrender and tell the medical person what your needs are, any type of documentation you can bring from your doctor will be helpful. The structure of the day is important to understand of uh, group punishment. It would seem that the Bureau of Prisons is only gonna punish people who violate rules, but that's not accurate. If somebody uses a cell phone in prison, the administrators might punish everybody in the camp and say, uh, no visiting for a week or we're turning off the phones for two days. I, I can't explain it. It's just part of prison. If somebody gets caught smoking, they may say, we're going to take away commissary for two weeks or limit commissary for two weeks. You didn't smoke, but you're still going to have this group punishment. I don't, I can't explain why they do things that way. But what I can say is you've got to succeed anyway. And you've got to be disciplined enough to say, this is prison. And it's the ways that they try and make you not want to come back to prison. If we understand that, you're not going to argue and talk about how illogical it is. You're just going to deal with it and say, I got to get out of here and never come back. And that goes to dealing with disappointment the last topic of today's webinar. You are going to be disappointed in prison. There's going to be disappointment on many levels. 
people that you think on the world are not writing you enough or coming to see you enough or doing what you think they should do. Okay. That's life. It's hard to write a letter. When was the last time you wrote a letter to your grandma? Okay. It's hard. Understand that and just say, okay, understand that staff members are going to disappoint you. Understand that they're going to say no. Understand that Congress said that you're supposed to do something and staff members are going to say no. You've got to know how to use administrative remedy to, to, to deal with it. And you're going to have to fight, you know, all the time, but you're also going to have to say, okay, what's the right thing to fight? Sometimes it's worth it to lose a battle in order to win the war. The goal is to get out of prison with your dignity intact and get off of supervised release and go on to live a life of meaning and relevance and dignity. And doing that is going to be an exercise in humility and a commitment to deal with disappointment. So I, I, I just, I can't emphasize that enough. I had to go through that for 9,500 days and it's okay. I came out okay. And you're gonna come out okay. And, and I just expect obstacles and really focus on your personal development things that you can cope with and understand other people are going to disappoint you. And, and so that's really what I wanted to finish with on the next webinar. I've got it here as First Step Act, but a lot of that is going to uh, depend on what I learn in these, these interviews that I expect to do this week. I, I've mentioned earlier that, I expect that we, we interview these subject matter experts. I'd really encourage you to go to this page here and look at these subject matter interviews that I, subject matter expert interviews that I do, because you can learn a great deal from them. Um, but I'm going to interview the guy who is in charge of Bureau of Prisons uh, Correctional Program Division. And that has a lot to do with the First Step Act. So that is, um, I'm going to get, I know I'm going to get a lot of information. I will be publishing that information on the website. And I will be uh, teaching about it in next week's webinar. And I'll be sending it to people who are in prison. So um, I'll be fluid in it. But of course, if anybody has questions, I'm always going to do my best to respond to those questions. That's not only while you're outside, but also while you um, are, are, are serving the sentence. So that's what I wanted to share today. Um, I'm going to be available to ask, uh, respond to questions pertinent to the webinar. If you've got questions pertinent to the webinar, um, you're more than welcome to unmute yourself or ask in chat and I will respond. I think Chuck said that you had a question. Uh, what was it? What programs are available to reduce one sentence if the sentence is less than a year? Can I unmute you, Chuck? Let me do it. Let me see if I can. How do I do that? Uh, participants. Oh, here we go. Participants. Where's participants? Oh, there we go. So Chuck asked to unmute. Hmm. Can you unmute yourself, Chuck? There you go. Oh, are you talking now? No. I think we we're both trying to unmute. Right? Can you hear me? I hear you now. What was your question? Um, going back to last week, and you may have, uh, Michael, addressed it. Um, I'm non-vaxxed. And... Uh, oh, that's, I told you I would get that information on this webinar when I do tomorrow. I will be okay. at, how, how long until you surrender? Uh, I still have not gotten my notice. Okay, well, you're okay then, because I'm gonna. He's coming. He was on this summer vacation. He gets back on the 18th. I hope to be able to interview him on the 18th. But if if it's not going to be the 18th, it's going to be the 17th. But that's one of the questions on my list. I just want to give you really good information, not a guess. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And the other questions are um, if Larry was kind enough to uh, hang out after the webinar. I just wanted to get his advice. My sentence is eight months. <laughs> okay. I guess I should feel blessed <laughs> regarding that. But um, I'd like to um, implement yeah, you want to talk a plan. To Larry. 
Have you connected with Larry before? Uh, I sent an email to Sam yesterday, and Sam forwarded it to Larry, and Larry responded. So I do have Larry's email. Okay. Um, I will follow up today. Okay. And, and I'll make sure that Larry sets an appointment with you to go over. Because if you have eight months, yeah, it, you should get this stuff kind of teed up before you go. I know that we have other people on our team that have like a year or something. Mm -hmm. They should also be talking with Larry before they go so that we can, he can get started. So if you haven't connected with Larry and you've got less than a three-year sentence or less, please send an email to Sam and make sure he connects you to Larry. Um, I'm available. I just, that's not my area, but I will gladly make sure it happens. So okay. we want to get, we want to help you before you get there. Okay. Should I initiate the conversation with Larry via email or should? Uh, yeah, just, um, I'll, I'll do it today. Okay. I, okay I'll take, I'll give you my word. I'll, I, in fact, I'm going to do it right now. Hold on a second. Um, I'm going to put an email right now. Larry. Is there anybody else on there that has not connected with Larry that has less than a year? Is that you, Samantha? I can't see. Hi. Uh, okay. Hi, this is Abraham. I haven't connected to Larry, and I was uh, texting Sam um, as you were talking to see, because I am pressed for time. I'm going in on Tuesday to Seagoville. Uh, and what's camp. your sentence, Abraham? 10 months. Okay. I'm going to make sure this happens today. Um, connect with Larry. So it's, it's going to be Chuck, Abraham, anybody else? Samantha, have you connected with Larry? You have. Okay. Um, okay. Please connect with Chuck and Abraham. They were on webinar today. They were on webinar today. They have webinar today. Thank you, Chuck. They need to get uh, started with prep for CARES Act. Okay, I'm said I just texted that to Larry and okay. he will um, I, I have no doubt he'll connect with you today. Okay, thank great. you so much. Yes. Hello. We're unmuted now. Yeah. You're unmuted, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, first first of all, for anybody that hasn't connected with either Larry or Sam, they're great. I mean, they're wonderful. Okay. Um, my quick question was he had already prepared our paperwork for um, submitting we surrender the twenty ninth. And, and the 78 days is up on October 14th on my calculations. Can I take that, the copies of that paperwork in with me or do I print that out from, a, from an email from you guys closer to that date? Don't bring anything in with you, as little as possible. Um, Larry will send it to you when you get there or have somebody else send it to you because it's going to be modified likely, right? You're going to do some things in there and, and he'll be able to modify it. <clears throat> so yeah, don't bring anything with you because... You don't want to be pushing the Bureau of Prisons. Well, right? I, don't, I, don't, I don't necessarily want to give away our hand either. Yeah, okay. that's what you don't don't bring it, don't bring it with you. But but have it ready. It's just going to be easier for Larry to do before you go. If you have more than two years, then it's not that relevant because there a lot's going to change in two years. But a year, but a year or less, you should definitely get it done now. Hello, I need to do that too. So, Who's that? Margaret? Margaret? Yeah, I need to do the same thing, but I'm not sure how I talk to you. We'll, but We'll take care of it. Are you? Have you spoken with Larry before? No, no. Okay. Let me and I have uh, August 30th is my date, older son, and it's three-month sentence. Three-month sentence? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but, I'm, but I'm an old toad. I'm 75. That's young. I'm, I, that's super young. What are you talking? My grandma's hundred and one. Yeah, well, I just want to do the best I can here. Of course you, know. you do. I I just sent an email with your name as well. When do you surrender? The uh, end of August. Okay, so you've got time. I have time. Yeah, but yeah, but this is not going to take like a long time for Larry to do. He's going to interview you. He's going to go through those different factors, and he's going to make sure that he understands you so that he can help draft the document that you could submit when you get there. But we're going to help you. Don't worry. I'll Thank make you. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? No, sir. 
Thanks again, Michael. We appreciate you for, yeah. for giving us this opportunity to be to play a role. We're with you all the way through. Um, and uh, I, do, I do have one question. Okay. Um, in prison, will I have access to my email? Because what I've been doing is uh, making folders on different topics. So I would have easy, quick reference. On your e you mean your email in the society? When, when I'm in, yeah, the email, up, my, my, my laptop. No, 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 nothing like that. It's going to be. You can't see anything on your computer ever. You won't see that till you come home. Okay. Okay. I want you to look at a uh, look at this document. I'm going to share my screen. I think all of you should look at this document. Um, let me find Chrome here. Share. I want you to go to. Let me see here if I could find it for you. Let me see if I could find it. Corelinks. Corelinks. Oh, no, that's, is that? Yeah, core, uh, right here. Okay, so here's the article. I think everybody should look at this page. I'm going to drop it into the chat. Um, there's the chat. Where have I lost the chat? And, and they read all of this, correct? What's like, that? I said your emails, they read all of this. What do you oh, get? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Always, always go through prison with the expectation that anything you write, they're reading. But let me send this in the chat right now so you guys can grab it. Where's my chat now? I've got so many windows open on my screen that I don't see the chat. Chat. Oh, it's over here. Okay. So here is a direct link to the um, a very simple little tutorial on how email in prison works. I will also put it on the show notes. So when this page gets built, it'll be here as well. Um, core links system right there. Okay, so there's the link. So you can find it. And what you're gonna see is you're gonna see a little video of how you send emails. You can, I don't know if you can see, but on my screen, I see a fellow young man by the name of Clayton on the top right side of my screen. He's, new sure. member of our, he's a new member of our team, and he's going to be the one responsible that when you send emails to impact at prison professors or admin or whichever one they've given you, Clayton is going to learn how to, how to grab them and um, respond. So we'll be responding to you regularly. I'll be sending information through both email and through snail mail to try and help you through this process. Okay? Great. Okay. Thanks, Michael. All right. You guys have a great weekend. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to do this again tomorrow, and then I'll figure out which one went best, and I get the best information, and I'll publish it on the website. And I'll send that out with a recap. Okay? Great. Do we have to do we have to give lists not only of the people that are um, that we send mail to or or that re we receive mail from or how, so mail any, is anybody can write to you. They just anybody can write, and we can write to anybody. Yes, or, you, you may have to write their information, their name, and address. Some prisons require you to to print the label of the people you're writing, so you would just. That's why you want to write that down. But you can change that every day, right? So it's, there, there might be a limit of 20 or 30, but you could change it every day. Okay. Okay. Hey, hey, hey Michael. Yeah, who is Quick that? Quick question. It's uh, Lance here. Lance Hi, here. Lance. How's it going? I, 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 was re I spoke to Sam earlier. I was referred to your, your community team, Diane Bass. She's one of my representations. So, I've been um, for many years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She told me about you guys. So, um, so really quick on the, the 20, uh, you know, I was received the uh, 12 months in the day. And so on that 25% that you, that you talked about where if you, you know, spend 25% of your time, um, you'll be eligible for some of those programs. Mm -hmm. How, how long does that typically take, take, uh, how long does that typically go into place after that 25% uh, of the time is up? Is well, some, it, so if you, some people for fortunate, 
right? Mm-hmm. On 12 months in a day, you, you serve about 10 months. Is it going to be ultimately at the yep. end of the day with good time? So yep. at two and a half, three months, you could be transitioning to home confinement if all the stars align well. Have you spoken okay. with Larry? No, just Sam. Okay, so we got to connect you with Larry as well. When do you okay. surrender? Uh, I'm not sure. I just got my sentence yesterday. So You got sentenced yesterday? <laughs> yesterday, yep, yesterday. Are you here in Orange County? Uh, yeah, I live in Orange County, but it was this was in Kansas City. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, um, I'll connect you with Larry so that we can get started. You, you've got time. It, it, it's, it's only going to take – the phone call is going to last with Larry a half an hour or so. He's going to write it, and then he'll – prepare the document and he'll send it to oh. you when you're there. Okay. So typically after that two and a half or three months, then you know something in that time frame. Is that what, uh, is that what you're saying? Or? If all the stars in our alignment, right. mm-hmm. it's going to happen in two and a half months. I always oh, wow. there's a problem, right? Okay. Just the Bureau okay. Of prisons. I, I yeah. got to expecting problems. And then gotcha. that's the, if there is a problem, the work that Larry does with you before is going to help you push it. So oh. if it doesn't happen at two and a half months, it's going to happen at three and a half for four months. But you're going to, gotcha. you know, we're going to ad- advocate, help you advocate to get it done. Okay, that makes sense. And typically, last question, typically when you guys do this process, I know you've probably done it dozens of times. What do you, I mean, what do you see the percentage outcome of it getting done in that two and a half? Yeah, well, I, I would encourage you, if you said you just came into our community, you probably have not seen any of my stuff. I would encourage you to watch some of the interviews that I have done with the former director, because it's way better to hear it from him than from me. Mm. But thousands mm. of people, they've let thousands, tens of thousands of people out. <laughs> and people that have had to go through compassionate release, he said, of those people... of them had to go through this process of fighting, okay, of pushing, Mm. okay? So it's it's institution by institution because the warden is the one that has the discretion, okay? So these are discretionary matters. It's you don't have a right, Mm. okay? Gotcha, okay. This is about discretion. And so your job is to learn, okay, what buttons can I push? What levers can I pull? to advance my candidacy. And mm. that's what we want to help you do. Gotcha. Okay. That makes perfect sense. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you. I appreciate all of you for believing in us. And uh, I'll always work hard to prove worthy of your trust. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mike. Thank you. I'm Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Sure.